So here with Frank now, after I was out at my post, which was outdoors, I'm pleased to say, uh, you get to feel, did, could you feel that vibration, Frank, oh, yes, this time yes, in indeed. here? It just roared across the swamp came out and hit us uh, just like a, uh, you know, like, like something really uh, slapping you in the face. But it was a very welcome feeling, wasn't it? I, I heard you talking about James Michener. James Michener was standing at my arm. It was the first shuttle launch that he had seen. A little later in the program, uh, Jim Michener will be with us to give us his impression. Also, I think, Frank, the impression that I interested me most was Gene Cernan. Last night, we were out at the pad together, and he looked at me and said, I've got to fly that thing. He's serious. He's ready to go back. He might well be. Uh, anybody who has ever experienced that uh, magnificent uh, sensation, you know, of riding what is essentially uh, a bomb up into the skies and uh, knows what it's like, uh, surely must relive it many, many times. Cernan, of course, also is uh, one of those people who can look up at the moon and uh, experience a certain kind of feeling because he's one of the few human beings on Earth who's ever actually walked on it. Sure, told, all of the astronauts want to want to get back into it. Everybody that, uh, that's ever done it the kind of regrets that uh, time has gone by. Well, as Gene said, the government, we spent so much of the people's money on his training, we ought to get our money's worth and put him back into it. <laughs> that probably wouldn't set very well with the astronauts who are now in training and who have waited forever and ever, it would seem to some of them. That's one of the things that always impresses me about this program, David, the dedication and the commitment that these uh, men, and now women, must make. Uh, all of this training and the years of work and study, very, very hard work, uh, leading up to essentially one experience. But out of that experience, of course, uh, comes their own contribution to the continuation of the space program, and they all make contributions that are extremely valuable on later flights. In this mission, look at Lenore and Alan, yes. who have been in the program since 1967, scientists now also pilots, but they are looking forward to going into space. Gene Cernan, a little later, will tell us what that uh, is like that feeling of opening the hatch and going out into space wearing a suit, and that's the experience that Lenore and Allen will have, uh, I guess, early Sunday morning. Yes, yes. Five years ago, dropped him in an X-1 rocket plane from a B-29 bomber, and he pushed past the 660-mile-per-hour uh, sound barrier, and uh, they've been talking about it ever since. You are now uh, 60 years old, but you could, if you wanted to, fly that space shuttle couldn't you yeah i would imagine so would I'm, you like I'm to still, oh that that's a heck of a question you're darn right i would so that would be the only way to fly in space in my opinion yes you haven't been able to say that about every aspect of the space program in the last 20 years well that's right because <clears throat> i don't like to ride in air, airplanes i like to fly them james and this one is as close to flying an airplane as you've seen yeah. yet yeah well that was quite a launch wasn't it well what do you what what do you think of that you've seen launches before did yeah but I like to see equipment work perfectly, and, and that did. Well, let's roll that tape again, and we'll watch a, a perfect uh, equipment working perfectly, in your words. And that happened about 31 minutes and ago. Solid and the, the and things that have happened throughout the years, James, like we used to burn liquid oxygen and alcohol with very small amounts, you know, and those guys are gulping stuff uh, that would run us for a year in the early rockets. But uh, all of the systems in, a, in an aircraft like this, and I call it an aircraft because it is, when it works perfectly, it makes you feel good. And I'm sure the crew uh, were quite pleased that the thing went off the way it did. And tell me, how far after a standing start from the launch pad was the orbiter going faster than the speed of sound? Oh, probably when it went through about uh, 30, 31,000 feet, straight up. You, um have, uh, uh, as, we, as we said, not had a whole lot of respect necessarily, playfully sometimes, about astronauts. Overmeyer, Robert Overmeyer, the uh, pilot on this mission, yeah. said that uh, if they had to call him a space trucker, he could live with that if that's what it takes to fly. Is space trucking a noble venture for well, I, a pilot? Well, I, I suppose so, yeah, because uh, we're beginning to do more and more missions in space now, and, and the shuttle is a marvelous vehicle to do those missions with. And, uh, and the shuttle itself, obviously, uh, which is not a valued to, as a fighter or something like that, it's a workhorse. And uh, like Overmeyer said, to be a space shuttle pilot, man, to be a trucker, I, I'd, I'd be called anything to fly it. Too. Yeah. Um, is there any possibility that, that you might be able no, to do I, that one day? I've no. had my fun uh, for the last 40 years. You know, I've flown, although I still fly quite a bit and uh, am exposed to some good systems. Uh, these guys are better trained than I ever was or ever will be. Huh. It's their job and it's good. Um, 
you uh, were lobbying for something along these lines a long time ago, and if, and if they'd listened to you, how many years ago well, might, might we have been sitting here watching that space I shuttle? I think I and a lot of military guys uh, were, would have seen something like this on a, about a 75% scale back in 1968, uh, before the 70s, uh, in airplanes like the X-20 or a dinosaur. But the decision was made that space would be for peaceful purposes, and, and that's the way it went. And uh, we're a little bit behind the Soviets right now. Do you think so? Yeah. In what, re in what regard in, are we in behind? In space it? weapon systems that have to be developed. Uh, good or bad, they've got to be developed. So you think in NASA is in a catch-up mode? I think they are, and also NASA is, is uh, operating the workhorse that will be used. Well, if they go as fast as you did, that catch-up shouldn't be too hard to make up. I hope not. Sir. Brigadier General Chuck Yeager, it's been a pleasure having you with thank us you. on this launch day. Back to New York. All right, Jane, General Yeager, thank you. Again, we will continue to seek uh, worldwide reaction to the death of Sylvia. George Nelson, who is known as Pinky to all of his friends and to the rest of the world since he was the Capcom on STS-3 and STS-4, Pinky Nelson sat here, I want to tell you, and while, we, while the uh, shuttle was about to go up, we were talking about Brezhnev, we were doing other things, and I mentioned to him that we were being terribly casual about this, and he said, I'm not. <laughs> Pinky, uh, still excited? Getting more casual or what? No, still excited. <laughs> still excited. When the payload bay doors open, uh, this afternoon, the first order of business, Bill Lenore and Joe Allen get that first satellite out of there. You are also a mission specialist. Tell me, first of all, the feeling about doing that task, actually getting up there and performing what, what you've been trained to do? Well, it's what we've been working for, I've been working for for four and a half years, and Joe and Bill have been working for for almost 15, so they, I'm sure they're ready. I'm sure they're ready. I wonder if you could explain, we have some animation of how the satellite will be launched. I wonder if you could explain exactly what's going to be happening when they blow those uh, explosive bolts so it goes. Take a look. Yeah, just okay. take a look at the animation as it comes up and tell me uh, what, what will be happening. Okay. They spin the satellite up as on an automatic sequencer. Then they blow some bolts which are broken by an explosive. And the satellite then is pushed out by four springs. And then 45 minutes later, the booster rocket will fire to put it into a high orbit. Now, so this is before the perigee motor has fired, right? Right. Okay. Well, that's the animation. Later this afternoon, we hope we will have some actual TV pictures of, of that satellite being deployed. Pinky Nelson, thanks. We'll be talking to you a little bit later on. Okay. I'm Lynn Sherr in Houston. Back to you, Charlie. Thank you, Lynn and Pinky.